Welcome to another episode of Putting the Pieces Together with Jigsaw Learning. Today's topic is responsive behavior supports. Responsive behavior supports is the culmination of work of our former colleague, learning associate, Barb Harris, and the learning in this work in this area still grows. We are fortunate that Barb has passed the torch to our team of learning associates so that the ideas around responsive behavior supports can continue to grow and evolve. I'm joined today by two such learning associates, Colette Sylvester and Kathleen Robinson, who are going to share a little bit about responsive behavior supports and the 10 components with us. So hi, ladies. Hi, Jen. Hello. <laughs> so before we dig into the depths of responsive behavior supports, we do want to acknowledge the work that Barb mm -hmm. has done in this area and her influence on the understanding of this work. We know that she was very specialized in her role with Jigsaw Learning because of her background as a professional and the learning that she had done. So we know that we took a lot away from her. What might be a key acknowledgement you'd like to share about having worked alongside Barb? I had so many opportunities to work alongside Barb and I consider her just a mentor and a friend and one of the things I really appreciate about her work is it's really kids first and it's all about support. One of the main things that I took away from Barb, although I, I took away many things from, from her, um, you know, she always said, you know, if students have struggle with learning, we teach them. And the same applies for behavior. If students are having trouble um, behaving, then we need to teach them how and support them in being part of the class rather than punishing. And I thought that's just such a great message and it really speaks to the student-centered nature of this work. Barb attributed her professional experience and her interactions with Jigsaw Learning Partners to the development of responsive behavior supports. How might your understanding of collaborative response inform the notion of responsive behavior supports as we continue to move forward? You know, for, for myself, my professional experience, the, the bulk of my career uh, has been spent uh, working as a inclusive support lead in my school, um, f you know, first starting out for 12 years as preschool to grade six uh, classroom support teacher. So supporting with behavior was, uh, you know, a big part of my journey. And then I went on to be a learning strategist in a high school setting uh, at seven to 12, where I continued on that, that journey. Um, and a lot of my professional development over the years has definitely been in that realm of supporting behavior. And I think, you know, when I came across and, and joined Jigsaw Learning and learned more about responsive behavior, um, supports and, and Barb's work at it, I want to say it resonated with me on a very deep level, um, and it goes specifically to what Car Kathleen articulated in that, um, you know, teaching students um, who need support how they need to <laughs> how they need to be learning uh, to behave. My understanding of responsive behavior support uh, was deepened because of my, my past experiences and, and learning as a classroom teacher and an inclusive ed support uh, person who was often you know, the, the key role uh, in my school in supporting children with behavior. And the responsive behavior supports that Barb developed really breaks things down into a level that I think you know, everyone from educational assistance all the way up can understand how to truly support behavior so that it isn't punitive, that we're actually teaching and uh, approaching things with compassion and kindness it changes everything. One of the things that I remember about Barb is how often she used to say behavior is communication. Can you elaborate on that idea of what you think she meant by that? You know, um, sometimes our students don't have the words to express what they're feeling or what they're experiencing or what's going on is really too deep um, to really talk about. 
And I think as adults, we find that too sometimes in those moments where we find ourselves maybe um, snapping at our our spouse or, you know, rolling our eyes. If, if, you know, those kind of things that we sometimes do offhandedly just out of frustration. And just, we need to understand that our children are, they're younger. They are not, uh, their brains aren't as fully developed as ours. If we were composed and present at that moment and grounded, we would be able to express how we felt or express our, our annoyance or our discomfort. If they could say it, they would. And that's generally how it goes with students. If they could, they would. Every student wants to be successful. No student wants to be the child that's lashing out or throwing stools or bullying. They don't, they don't want that. And they, there's a message behind what they're saying. There's a, maybe for us as adults, our cause of snapping out our spouses, we didn't get enough sleep or we're really hungry or we have a problem from work on our mind. And the same applies to our students. If there's a behavior, there's a reason behind that behavior. Only they can't communicate it necessarily with words. They communicate it through their actions. So uh, our task is to look deeper into what those actions are telling us. And in that way, behavior is communication. And we um, get to put pieces of the puzzle together to create a hypothesis of what that student is communicating. Um, Bar created a really beautiful graphic um, of a tree to show um, what is above the gram is what we see, what students are um, expressing through their actions, and what's underground, the roots of the tree, are what the student is experiencing, whether it's trauma or um, disrupted attachment or um, difficulties with regulation and executive functioning or uh, learning disability. Those things are things that we that are not visible to us. So it's our job to sort out what the roots of that behavior may be. So as part of her work around responsive behavior supports, Barb shared a blog series around the 10 components. And we're going to get into the 10 components a little bit from now. Before we go there, she talked a little bit about a responsive behavior structure. As you continue to move forward with this work on Barb's behalf, what did she mean by a responsive behavior support structure? I think with the 10 components of responsive behavior that you know, Barb's really speaking about that whole school community that is responding um, in the layers of supports um, outlined uh, as collaborative response. So everything from tier one, where we're talking about planning and, uh, you know, those universal strategies that we put in place to support students to the next level of tier two, where we're differentiating for student needs and what we have to do to support what students need within the context of the classroom. Our first five um, components of her responsive behavior series fall in that tier one and tier two layers of support. And then when you move into, um, you know, supports that are outside of the classroom and you go into tier three, where you'd have you know, those traditional roles of the inclusive support lead and family outreach worker in the, in the school that are going to work with staff to support uh, behavior and, and behavior observations and educational assistance supports and all those things. Um, those are the six to 10 uh, layers of or responsive behavior supports that she put in place. And, you know, going into tier four, where we're looking at those outside supports for students. So what it does is it just creates a structure and a framework for an entire school to give students the team of support that they need to be successful. What role do you think district leaders, system leaders have with the imp implementation of responsive behavior supports? I think um, providing teachers with, with the structures 
and the embedded time I think is huge because without time to build supports for students and without the professional development that's needed um you know it's not often identified till you start getting into meetings and and they start looking at well we want to put nonviolent crisis intervention in place for students as a support but the, but the teachers don't have the training and so identifying those key areas that need to be addressed to make sure that uh, again it comes down to the the kids getting the team that they, they deserve. System leaders can really organize themselves in terms of especially those tier four supports and ensuring that they have an organized team to go out to schools and support at the, at the school level um, within case conferences. Without clear structures in place, um, you know, it, <laughs> something that could be done at a differentiated classroom level ends up jumping to tier three, uh, where your inclusive support team gets totally bombarded with requests. Um, so I think when administrators and school leaders put these structures in place, um, everybody learns to, to work. And it's not, it's not a clean linear process by any stretch, it's, but I think people learn to um, work within the framework that's created and there's less breakdown in communication because there's clear structures in place to support it. And Colette, can I piggy, piggyback on your thought there? Um, you know, and not only jumping from the tier one level to the tier three level, but without those clear processes in place, there's that chance of, you know, a lot of referrals going to central office that could be handled within tier one, two, and three supports. Yeah, agreed. And I think there's that breaking that myth that there isn't capacity within your staff to deal with a lot of it too. So um, to add to that, like once, once teams start collaborating about the supports that they're putting in place for students at the classroom level, you build the capacity within the team to handle things as they come up and and also the capacity for the team to recognize we need more here we need outside supports we need <laughs> we need professional development that we don't have um, and then there's a clear sort of avenue and channel and pathway to make sure that that happens